We do have a great Heavenly Father, and uh, when we think about Father's Day, it's certainly great to be able to celebrate Him. Um, he's, he is the perfect, He's the perfect dad. Your dad may or may not have been perfect, but, uh, but you have a perfectly hev- perfect Heavenly Father, and uh, as we gather together on Father's Day, it's always an honor to be able to, uh, to really focus in on Him. He also allowed us to be able to, uh, to talk, about, talk about dads. I mean, He gave dads to us as a gift, and so we, man, we celebrate we celebrate Father's Day, and so let me say a Father's Day to all of you who are here. I know a lot of folks are out traveling, they're out visiting family and those kinds of things, and uh, maybe some folks are, are watching online because you weren't able to be here today, and that's great. Glad, uh, glad you're joining us online, uh, but, uh, but it's just a, just a big happy, happy Father's Day to everyone. Good to have uh, my mom and my brother. They're, uh, they're right down here, and so they, they took a little bit of time out of vacation. The rest of my family, they they decided they were going to start vacation yesterday without me and Madison. That doesn't seem right to me, but uh, they're just down the street, uh, down in St. Simons, and so they came up to uh, to a service today. So you be sure and welcome them uh, after after church. Don't don't get up and go talk to them right now. Just wait till after I'm finished. And but uh, but then be sure and, and welcome them here this morning. Let me, let me tell you something about Jesus. Jesus was not a he was not a dad, of course. Um, although there there are certainly some modern stories and even some modern movies that have been made that that uh, that try to portray Jesus as a dad and that actually comes from a from a real teaching that Jesus was a dad whatever he was not a dad but he was a man and let me tell you about Jesus that something about him that may surprise you Jesus was a man's man now let that sink in for a second because you you don't hear about Jesus like that very much we don't really think about Jesus in those terms. We think about Jesus as a guy, you know, he's kind of, he kind of floated around a lot. You know, he probably would have been a, uh, maybe a few decades ago, he would have been one of the hippies or whatever. But, but that's, that's not Jesus. Jesus was a man's man. He was the kind of man that other men wanted to follow. And when I say other men, I'm not just talking about the pansies of his day. I'm not just talking about guys who didn't have anybody else to look up to. I'm talking about all kinds of men in Jesus' day looked at Jesus and saw something in him that said, I want to follow him. I mean, we're talking about noblemen and peasants. We're talking about rich men and poor men. We're talking about fishermen who were the roughest and tumblest of the day. They wanted to follow him. The moral and the immoral. All kinds of men looked at Jesus and saw something in him that said, I want to be like that. Um, it, what, what we find in Jesus, just, just looking at his followers, the people who chose to follow him, um, we see that there is something in Jesus that is so superior to anything that the world throws at us today when we want to emulate a man He is the one that we would look to. Everywhere he went, men were drawn to him. And I want to I just want to show you today the kind of the kind of man that you and I can become. Ladies, maybe you're just kind of writing down a few notes to give to your man, okay? But I want to guys, I want to talk to you about a man that you and I can become when we really choose to follow him. I want to talk to you today about all the king's men. I, I think about uh, I think about what does it take to be a to be a real man. You know, real men are hard to come by nowadays, especially when the things the that, that we see and the things that are thrown at us and are put right in front of us that says this is a real man. What is it that is really a real man? I think about a think about a little boy who was uh, his dad was traveling and uh, for his job and he went out of town for a little while and so the little boy you know he sat down with the little boy he said okay now listen I want you I want you to I'm gonna be gone now for a little over a week and I want you to kind of take the reins of the home I want you to I want you to lead in the home and so he said you know what I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna be the leader here and so he kind of kind of took took his dad's place when his dad was out of town well the little sisters they didn't really like this little boy being the head of the home and they began to they began to challenge him and and say why who who made you in charge who left you in charge 
Why are you the one that's in charge? And they started throwing out scenarios. Well, what if this happens, what are you going to do? What if that happens, what are you going to do? And they kept throwing out scenario after scenario, and he was, he was taking it all in, and he was just listening. He thought about it. When they finally got finished, he thought about it for a few minutes. He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to do what Daddy does. I'm going to go ask Mama. Is that really what a real man is like? What is a real man like? I want you to turn your Bibles to Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1. Good thing is, is you don't have to take my advice because I, I fall short all the time. We can go to the Bible and find out what a real man is like. Psalm chapter 1. Take out your, your outline that is there in, in the bulletin that you received. And if you like to take notes, you can take out a pen. If not, the, the, the notes that are there will still be a good help to you to kind of follow along where we are. But, uh, but take these things out. And I want to talk to you about the four marks of a man of God. Four marks of a man of God. And men, this is something that you can hopefully apply here today as you leave this place. Ladies, this is also something that would be good for you to pay attention to because this is the kind of guy that you want to pray that your man will become. This is the kind of guy, in, in fact, in, in our series, we're kind of taking a step out of our series when the time is right. I've gotten, I've gotten a few questions about, about relationships and, and ladies, if you are looking for a relationship, this is the kind of thing that you want to look for. This is the kind of man that you want to have or the man that you want to pray for. Or maybe you just want to, you know, quietly tonight just put these notes under the pillow of your man and maybe he'll pay attention to these and become this kind of an individual. But Psalm chapter 1, I want us to look through this passage and I'm going to break it down, but I think it's such a great chapter in the Bible that I want us to just read it as a unified whole and then we'll go back and talk about it in parts. Psalm chapter 1 in verse 1. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water which yield its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked, they're not so. But they are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Four marks of the man of God. They'll be behind me, and they're on the page that I hope is right in front of you. The very first thing that we find in this psalm is that the man of God is separated from sinners. He is separated from sinners. Now before we take this too far and before we jump to too many conclusions, we need to take this, what I'm saying, I hope that you will take this in balance. Because a believer in Christ, a man of God, is not an elitist. He's not one who... who uh, who is going to ignore what Jesus had to say and what Jesus did. There are two things we've got to consider when we think about being separated from sinners. We've got to think about Jesus' example and Jesus' exhortation. His example was is that he would even spend some time and he would go and eat with those who were recognized to be sinners, people that were criticized as being sinners in his day. Jesus actually spent time with them and was labeled a friend of sinners. That was his example, but then he also had an exhortation. The exhortation was, I want you to go out into the world so that you can make a difference. So we have to, we have to take all of this in balance, but Psalm chapter 1 is going to show us that a man of God is separated from sinners. When our involvement, when our involvement in the world around us becomes a, um, an impediment, a barrier to our walk with God, that is when action must be taken. I, I want to show you what happens. I want to show you the warning of progression that we are given in Psalm chapter 1. Really, it's, it, it all comes in the first verse because the first thing that he says is he does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. The first, the first step toward, toward this, this warning is, is simple interest where the man is walking in this wicked counsel. Now, the man who is walking, he is going to, he's very curious as to what 
the world thinks, as to what the world does. And he will spend some time, and he will study, and he will look at the people who are around him, and he will say, well, how is it that they would respond to this situation? What is it that they would do? How do they think? What is it that they think about what I'm doing, or about the d- direction that I want to go in? And so they began to have an interest in what the world says and what the world's opinion is. They will seek out that kind of counsel. Let me just tell you, you remember the old, the old saying, the curiosity killed the cat? Well, that's what happens here when you seek out the counsel of the wicked. You might be curious as to what they think, and it can be the first step in a dangerous path that you would be taking. So notice the first step is interest, but the, the second step goes a little bit further than that, and that is involvement. Because it says that he is standing in the path of, of sinners. Now, you remember that word stand, that, that word stand, we also find it's, it's more of a defensive posture. It's the same word that we have over in Galatians chapter 6 when, when the Bible begins to talk about uh, uh, the armor of God. And it talks about standing in that armor. It is a defensive position. It's where we are more entrenched in what the world is doing. It's not just, uh, it's not just curiosity. It's not just uh, seeking out the counsel of what others around us would think. It's now we are entrenched in this kind of a lifestyle and we are ready to defend what we are doing, make excuses for what we are doing, and that is the second step in a dangerous path. But it doesn't end there because that's really not just where the danger ends. You see, the problem goes to the next step, and that is influence. Because he is going to sit in the seat of scoffers. Now, when we're talking about sitting in the seat, what the reference would have been in the ancient world is when you walked into a city, you had the city gates, and, and right there at the city gates were all the elders. The elders would gather there, and they would sit. And people would come out and they would, uh, people in the city or maybe even outside of the city, they would come to the city gates and if they had an issue that they needed to settle with someone or they needed advice for something or they needed some judgment of something that was going on in their lives, they would go to that city gate to where the elders were sitting and they would ask their advice or they would ask their opinion or they would ask for their judgment. And whatever judgment was passed down, that settled the issue. And so that, those, those, those elders who were sitting at the city gates, they had tremendous influence in that city. And he's saying, the, the psalmist here is saying, listen, a, a man of God is not going to sit where the scoffers are and influence other people in the ways of the world. In other words, this man may have started out by seeking, seeking advice from the world and thinking, what is the world going to do? And it's going to end by him giving that same advice, that same ungodly, wicked advice to people coming behind him. That is, that is the danger that he is sharing here. The man of God is going to separate himself from those kinds of things. He is going to seek out godly wisdom, godly counsel. He's going to follow through with a godly lifestyle, and then he's going to continue that trend by giving godly advice to people behind him. I remember, I remember being a, a, as a teenager, and of course this is, I, I'm assuming it's normal for teenagers. I don't know. My kids tell me I'm not very normal, but I think I'm kind of normal. But I remember being a teenager, and I remember, I remember my friends kind of rubbing off on me. You know what I mean? I mean, there were the, the, the ways that they would talk, I would talk those ways sometimes. I, I remember I, I had a particular friend, and he had a, he had a very unusual laugh. You know, I, just kind of one of those laughs that stood out. And I don't know, after a while, I realized I'm starting to laugh like he does. That ain't me. I had another friend, and he had, he had, a, he had certain twitches about him, twitches in his face or his neck or whatever. And, and after being around him for a while, I realized I'm twitching. I don't, I don't twitch, and yet I'm twitching. What's going on? It's because those people that you hang out with, you tend to become like them. And we, 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 we kind of thrust that, that truth, and we know that that's true. We kind of thrust that truth on, on children and on teenagers and impressionable people like that. But let me tell you something. It happens to all of us. We're around that stuff long enough, and we begin to take on our surroundings. And so the psalmist says, the man of God is not going to, he's not going to immerse himself in that lifestyle and become like them. He is going to separate himself 
in balance, he's going to separate from himself so that his walk with God is pure and he can have an influence on the world rather than the other way around. Well, the psalmist goes on and he gives another mark of a man of God. And he says, the man of God is swayed by Scripture because his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law he meditates day and night. The man of God is swayed by Scripture the scriptures. Notice that his delight is in the law of the Lord. Thank God we live in the age of grace. The age of grace says that we don't live under the law. That is not a burden that is placed upon our shoulders, but we live in it. Two things. Two things that 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 is going to show itself up in. Two ways that that will show up in your life and in my life as to whether or not you are really swayed by scripture. Number one, is the man of God lives it. He lives it. He wants to know what it says so that he can carry it out. It's not just an academic exercise for him. He wants to know, how does God want me to live? And he lives it. I remember a few years ago, I was was pleasantly surprised by uh, an individual that I knew. That individual had just recently come under conviction for a lifestyle that she had lived. She came under conviction and she, she began to, to do the right thing. She began to, to follow God. She got back in church. She knew that she should have been in church. And I don't know that she ever really removed herself from church, but church was never a priority for her. And she got back in church and, and she began to, to seek out, what is it that God wants for my life? And I want to follow that pattern. And I remember as I was talking with her, here's what she said. She said, I'm ready to do what God wants me to do rather than what I want to do. That's a a profound statement that many, many people cannot make. I'm ready to do what God wants me to do rather than what I want to do. I'm just not where I thought I'd be. God can't bless that because of my choices. She said, you know what? I want to know what the Word of God says so that I can live that word. It's not an academic exercise. It's not going through the motions. It's not going to church because that's just what people do. I want to live it. Second thing that the man of God is going to do, if he's going to be swayed by scripture, he's not just going to to live it. He is going to learn it. I'm I'm going to meditate day and night. Men, let 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 me just throw this out here. I hope you're ready for this. And I hope it stings just a little bit. Well, I hope it doesn't apply to you, but for those of you that it does apply to, I hope it stings just a little bit. Why is it, why is it that most of the time, I'm not going to give a percentage because I've never done a scientific study on it, why is it that most of the time it is the mom or the wife who is dragging everybody to church? Why is that? Why, why aren't the men standing up and saying, this is where we're going? It is Sunday morning, it's just what we do. We're going. We're going to be there. Why, why, why is it that we leave that up to the women to do all the spiritual stuff? We say, oh, that's because that's that's, you know, she knows it a whole lot better than I do. I remember, reading, I, I remember seeing a, a sermon several years ago, and it really just kind of hit me between the eyes. I want you to think about a man. I want you to think about a man who's been, who's been an electrician. He's been an electrician for 40 years. For 40 years, this guy has done this. He's been all over the place. He's been in all kinds of circumstances. And he is a a well-oiled machine when it comes to an electrician. And his boss comes to him one day and says, I want you, I want you to take this, this young intern and I want you to teach him all the ropes about doing electricity. Imagine that elect, imagine that electrician saying, no, I can't do that. I don't, I don't really, I don't really feel qualified to do this. I don't really know anything about electricity. I mean, I know I've been doing this for a long time, but, but I, I just I, I don't feel comfortable teaching somebody else how to do electricity. What do you think that boss is going to think? That boss is going to look and think, well, what have I been doing with you for 40 years? What have you been doing? All you do is you just go and just show him the ropes, just show him what you're doing. And yet it comes to things in the church, it comes to spiritual things, it comes to things having to do with the scriptures, and men who say that they've been following God for 40 years, for 50 years, and, they, and, and you bring somebody alongside of them and say, hey, teach them what it means to be a believer. And you, they say, oh no, I can't do that. Get my wife to do it. 
I don't feel qualified to do that. Are you serious? After 40 and 50 years of following Jesus, you can't tell somebody this is what you do as a believer of Jesus Christ? It makes no sense. And yet, that's the, that's the out that men have all the time. Men, let me tell you something. If you want to be a man of God, learn the Scriptures and lead your people, lead the circle of influence that you have, whether it's a wife or wife and kids, or maybe you're single, maybe it's just maybe it's grandkids. I don't, lead your circle of influence to do the same thing as best you can to the best that God allows you to do it. The man of God is swayed by Scripture. We also find in verse 3 that he's like a tree firmly planted by the streams of water. It yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf doesn't wither, and in whatever he does, he prospers. The man of God is strong in spirit. He is intentionally planted. He's intentionally planted by God. Notice there in your outline, Matthew chapter 15 and verse 16, every plant which my heavenly Father did not plant shall be uprooted. God has intentionally planted you, man. And when they are influenced rightly, when they are influenced rightly, as we saw in the first two verses, there are three things that we can say about this man, about him being strong in spirit. Number one, he is a strength taker. The man of God is going to be a strength taker. Now, we live in a society, we live in a world that says a real man, a strong man, he don't need nobody. I mean, we, we've been brought up believing that. You go back to the days of John Wayne, and some of you are probably older than that, and you can name some manly man, you know, going back before that, but... You know, you go back to John Wayne, and then you, you move forward a little while, you get, you get to Chuck Norris, you know. You get to, you get to the 90s, and, and you, got, uh, you got Mission Impossible, you get to the 2000s, and you got Jason Bourne. You get to today, and you get John Wick, and all these guys, they're, they're, they're man's men. And they, they, don't need, they don't need anybody else, because they're going to conquer the whole world. I mean, they can go up and get, you know, you remember Rambo movies? There'd be like a thousand people out there. Rambo right in the middle of, hey, he's right in the middle like I am right here. And everybody's planted, you know, up there. And a, a thousand people and they're behind stuff. I don't get killed, but I can kill every one of them because I don't need nobody. Can I, can I, guys, can I just tell you something? I, let, let me just let you in on a clue. Movies are not real it's all fake, okay? If it's me and there's a thousand people up there and I got a gun and they got a gun, I'm dead. They ain't, okay? We, we are never wired to be lone rangers. We all, despite what you see, despite what you hear, we all come to a point where we need someone or something beyond ourselves all of us. And so the wise man, the man of God, is going to look outside of himself and draw strength from somewhere, and that somewhere will be God. Look in, look in your outline there at Matthew chapter 7. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, that's God's word, and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew, and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. You see, the man of God has found strength outside of himself, and he is willing to take that strength, take that help from, a, from a, an eternal source. He is a strength taker. That's why Paul said in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Not only is he a strength taker, he is a difference maker. Notice, notice in, in, uh, there in verse 3, his, it yields its fruits in its season and its leaf does not wither. It provides shade and sustenance. That's the idea here, shade and sustenance. He is a difference maker. You want to make an impact on life? The man of God, he doesn't just want to impact his business. He don't want to just impact the government. He don't want to just impact the church. He wants to impact impact the kingdom of God. He wants to make a difference in this world 
for the glory of God. And then number three, he is a kingdom shaker. And whatever do he does, he prospers. A, a lot of men want to do, I, I believe, I hope, I hope I'm right. There are a lot of guys, even in this room, maybe, maybe watching online, there are a lot of guys who want to make a difference. I mean, they want, to, they want to do big things for God that outlive this life, but they don't really know how. Listen, I can't give you, I can't give you a big old long outline. I'm not, I'm not wise enough for that yet, but let me, let me give you the first step, okay? The first step is simply to stay close to Him. You want to do something that outlives you? Stay close to God. That's why the psalmist said, Your word is a lamp to my feet. It's going to tell me the steps to take. I, I appreciate what Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, there in your outline. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. If you're taking down notes, underline in that passage right there, the power. He gives you the power to do what pleases Him. You can't do it on your own. But He will give you all that you need to be a kingdom shaker. The man of God is strong in spirit. Finally, we see in Psalm chapter 1 that the man of God is secure in salvation. Now we're going to lump the last three verses in here together and understand what it is that he is warning against. The psalmist is, in a positive way, saying that the man of God is secure in his salvation, but there are pretenders. And those pretenders are exposed by three different things in life. Number one, the pretender is exposed by circumstances. There are things that come his way, and it really reveals what's on the inside. It shows that he is really not a follower or at least not a strong man of faith. Life, let me, let, let me just tell you, in case some, many of you, many of you in here know a whole lot better than I do, life can blow you away. It can, it can really throw you for a loop. It can really mess you up if you're not solid. And, and, and it will, it can, and it will. Look at Matthew chapter 13. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's Word. When life throws all that life is going to throw at you, and let me just tell you, you there comes a day where you realize all that mess that you're hearing from the TV preacher, it is not true. It might work for them because it's gotten you to send them a ton of money, promising you that you're going to get some of that same stuff and it don't work that way, when you finally come to realize that that TV preacher ain't exactly telling you the truth, you are then going to be tested in your faith. And he says that, man, there are a lot of people, they, they've been sold this bill of goods, hey, you, you, just, you come to Jesus and everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to be work out just a-okay. You ain't got to worry about it. God's going to bless you with this, that, and the other, blah, blah, blah. And then problems come. And then you find out what kind of faith you really have. You see, the man of God is secure in his salvation, but that salvation or lack thereof is exposed, first of all, by circumstances. It's also exposed by shame. By shame. You see, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. The wicked man doesn't want to go hang out with other believers. A wicked man doesn't want to come and be in here in church because there is shame that is involved. Now let me just tell you something. I was having this conversation with, uh, with a member of our church. I, uh, he, he, knows, he knows a good bit about, about vehicles. And we were talking about changing, chain break, changing brakes, changing oil, that kind of stuff. And Let me tell you something. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how to do all that stuff. I mean, I can, I can change the oil in my car. You know why? Because YouTube. YouTube, you can do just about anything, right? I, I, I've, I know how to do all that stuff because of YouTube now. But I, most of the stuff, most of the stuff that happens in a mechanic shop, I don't know anything about. When I walk into, when I talk, walk into one of those mechanic shops and I'm walking in the back and those guys start talking about all this, all this mechanic mumbo jumbo, I start getting uncomfortable. Because I, I, I ain't got a clue what they're talking about. And, and I, I'm, supposed to, I'm supposed to maintain my manhood in front of all these guys who know all this stuff about mechanics. Like I'm supposed, and so, you know, I just stand there and I shake my head, you know. I just pray and they're not asking me a question. That's what I'm hoping for. 
I feel uncomfortable in that situation because I don't know anything about it. And here, the Bible says, a wicked man feels uncomfortable in the assembly of the righteous. When righteous men gather together, this guy's going to walk in, he's going to be like, "Mm -mm, that ain't for me because that's not the life that I want. You see, our salvation or lack thereof is exposed in our shame. Third, and finally, our our salvation or lack thereof will be exposed in our, in our sentencing. Because you see, the Lord knows the way of the righteous. He knows the way of the wicked. And there are men who walk among us who have fooled those people around us. They have fooled the church that they have been a part of. They have fooled their Sunday school class. They may have even fooled their own family. But when they stand before God, and God hands down His righteous judgment, there will be no fooling Him. You can hold up your charade, and you can make it look all good here in this life, but when you face God, there will be no way to hide what your true soul is. And the man of God will be exposed in the judgment. When the sentencing is passed down, It will be too late. Man of God, man who desires to be of God, man who is simply here just listening because he can't do anything else because his wife made him come to church today, let me tell you something. You will face God. And you will give an account of this life. And the only hope that you will have in that day is what have you done with the person of Jesus Christ. I've, I've, been, I've spent a lot of time on the road in the last three days. A lot of time. I mean, I feel like a trucker, okay? I've just been out on the road a lot. I've been listening to a lot of music. I've listened to a lot of good music. I've listened to a lot of bad music, okay? And there's one particular song um, talking about uh, uh, Billy Joel. And it's a song going back to the 70s, I believe. It was, be- it was before my time. Um, never, never really cared about all that stuff anyway, about, uh, about, about his music, but that's just personal preference. In his, in his song, Only the Good Die Young, in that song, he was just saying, you know what, you can, you can keep that. You can keep that because that life ain't a whole, that being good ain't a whole lot of fun anyway. He said, I'd rather enjoy life. Let me just tell you, man. Let me just tell you, woman. Let me just tell you, teenager, child. You can spend your time and you can, you can enjoy everything this life has to offer. You can spend all of your life pursuing all that this life has to offer. You can live 90 years and spend every last moment and enjoy life to the fullest. And one day you will face God and you will pay for it for all of eternity. 90 years is so short. It is such a brief time to sell away all of eternity. How foolish Billy Joel and his followers are. Let me encourage you, be a man of God. Find yourself secure in your salvation, knowing that you're going to face Him. And when that sentence comes, you will be found in Jesus Christ. And whatever you sacrificed in this life, whatever you gave up, whatever you didn't get to do or didn't get to see or didn't get to watch, whatever it may be, you, it, it will all fade away and it will all be found worth it for all of eternity. Man, woman, please, please come to Jesus. Come to and be saved. Don't delay. Come and be saved. In our time of invitation, I'll be standing down front, and if you would like to be saved, give your heart and life to Jesus Christ, and be secure in that salvation. Anyone who is in here, I'll be standing down front. During that time of invitation, just come down and talk with me. Let's settle this issue. Let's do it, and let's let's be secure in our eternity. God, we thank you for that security that is made possible in Jesus. Not because we're good, not because we made improvements in this life, not because we cleaned up our language. All those things are great. But God, because we have trusted you. And I pray for anyone 
man, woman, teenager, boy, girl, anyone who is not secure in their salvation, that they would find that security today before they walked out of here. I pray for those who know that they are saved. I pray for those men that we would stand up and be men, that we'd be, we would be men of God, men that are characterized in Psalm chapter 1. And that we are pleasing to you and that we have an influence on the people who are around us for eternity. God, have your own way in our lives in the next few moments as we, as we consider our own life. We consider our own spiritual life, our own eternal life. And as we respond to you, help us to do so in obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. As I'm standing down front, if you'd like to...